I welcome us to service this morning. I am very sure God has a word for us. And I want every one of us to please give me your understanding. Give me your mind. Without you going along with me, with your mind, today's teaching may not achieve what you ought to achieve. Today I'll be sharing with us on understanding the mercy of God. Understanding the mercy of God. If we do not understand a particular product or a particular thing, then we cannot enjoy the full benefit. Some time ago, I wanted to scan a document and send it to a friend. And I was driving. And I had a young chap beside me in the car. And I was telling the person, when I get out from driving, I will scan it to you and send it to you. And this young boy said to me, you can do it right now with your phone. And I looked at him. I said, you mean my phone can do it? He said, yes. He said, where is it? And right there in the car, he took my phone, took the script, and scanned it and sent it. I didn't know my phone had that functionality. I didn't understand the functionality of the phone to that extent. So because I did not understand it, there was no way I could have benefited from what it has to offer. Are you there, church? So when we are talking of the mercies of God in this month, we need to understand what the mercy of God entails. Without you and I having an understanding of the personality of God when it relates to his mercy, we may not be able to enjoy the full benefit of his mercy. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4 to 5. Ephesians 2, 4 to 5. I read, But God, who is rich in mercy, out of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace ye have been saved. But God, who is rich in mercy, our God is a God who is rich in mercy. Lamentation chapter 3, verse 22 to 23, it says, through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed because his compassion fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Talking of the mercies of God, that God is a God that is rich in mercy. He is not a God that is stingy or has a scarcity of mercy. In fact, that lamentation says, His mercies, they are new every morning. Which implies, the mercy for today, expired, even though it has not expired, God gives you a new mercy every day. When you wake up in the morning, always bear it at the back of your mind, there is a new mercy that has come for you. So let us look at what exactly is mercy. Mercy simply means compassion or forgiveness shown towards somebody. Shown towards someone who is within one's power to punish or to harm. Compassion and forgiveness shown to us someone whom it is within one's power to punish or to harm. It is at the prerogative of the giver. It is at the prerogative of the giver. What is mercy? Mercy is withholding punishment from someone who deserves it. Mercy is withholding punishment. For somebody who deserves it. Mercy is being patient with people's excesses and weaknesses. Mercy is being patient with people's excesses and weaknesses. What is mercy? Mercy is compassionate treatment to those in distress or who are hurted. What exactly again is mercy? Mercy is giving people a second chance, even when they don't deserve it. 
What exactly is mercy? Mercy is doing good to those who even hurt you. Doing good to those people who hurt you. What is mercy? Mercy is being kind to those who offend you. Mercy is being kind to those who offend you. What is mercy? Mercy is valuing relationship above rules. Mercy is valuing relationship even above set down rules and regulation. The question I want to ask you and I today is, how does mercy get across to you? Now, the Bible says in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, said, then God said, let us make a man in our image according to our likeness. Let him have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. This is a, this is a command that was given to man. But I want us all to know that before God said this in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, there was a conversation that took place even before the earth, before the world was created. And that you see in Revelation chapter 13, Revelation 13, 8. Revelation 13, 8. It says, and all who dwell in the earth will worship him. All who dwell in the earth will worship the beast, whose name are not written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Now listen carefully. Before creation took place, the Trinity met and they discussed that let us make man in our image. Let them have the opportunity to make choices. And the Trinity said to themselves, if we make man from the dust of the earth, then this man will not be exactly the way we are. He will be vulnerable. He will have the power to make choices. That was the deliberation. And God said, the Trinity said among themselves, that okay, if we make man in this manner, and they can become vulnerable, they can have choices, then there will be a challenge. What if they err and they fall? And God the Son said, the lamp said, I will go and die for them. And God the Father said, you are dead. God the Father said, you are dead. So at the foundation of the earth, the Bible says, the lamp that was slain from the foundation of the earth, Jesus Christ was already slain even from the foundation of the world. Mercy. Mercy. Jesus, the lamp. He says, the lamp. He says, all who dwell on the earth will worship him. Talking of the Antichrist. Whose name has not been written in the Lamb books of life. Of the lamb slain from the foundation of the earth. The fall of man, nothing misses God or catches God by accident. No. No, 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 no. God is the all-knowing God. He knows everything from the past. He knows the present. And he knows the future. He is the omniscient God. Which means he is the all-knowing God. Your challenge in life is not coming to God as a surprise. God is not running from pillar to post to solve your challenge. In fact, it has been solved even before the challenge came. All we just need to know is to imbibe and take the mercy that God has given. From the foundation of the world, before God said in Genesis chapter 1 verse 1, he says in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Before that time, Jesus Christ has already been slain. God the Father told Jesus the Son, you are dead, you are already gone. So the rest was just an expression of mercy. This is a strong expression of the mercy of God. When man fell in Genesis chapter 3, verse 21 to 24, 
Genesis chapter 3, 21 to 24. Also for Adam and his wife, God made toxic, uh, tunics of skin to clothe them. Who made the tunic of skin? God. Where did the skin come from? Animal. What, what would have to happen for them to get that skin to cover? The animal must die. There must be the shedding of the blood. God is the very first person because of redemption that shed blood. God is the very first person that killed. He had to kill an animal, took the skin, and used the skin as a covering for Adam and Eve. Look at that. He said, the Lord God made tonic of skin and clothed them. Without the shedding of blood, there cannot be mercy. Then the Lord said, listen again. A lot of people think that Adam and Eve being driven out from the Garden of Eden is a punishment to them. No, sir. No. It looks like a punishment, but it was still God's mercy being communicated to man. Behold, the man has become like one of us to know good and evil. And now, lest he put his hand and take also the tree, take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out of the garden to till the ground from which he was taken. So he drove out the man and he placed cherubim at the east garden of Eden and flaming swarm and a flaming sword which turned every way to guide the way to the tree of life. God put an angel, cherubim, to guide the way of the tree of life. There were two trees that God said they must never eat from. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. The one Adam and Eve ate was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So, Death was already inside man. And God saw that if these people, with that falling, in that falling state, sickness could afflict, pains could afflict. God now said, no, I will not allow them to eat of the tree of life. If they eat of the tree of life, man would have been trapped in this body. The man would have lived old and wrinkled and be very weak and yet would not be able to transit from this body. So God said, out of his mercy, Angel, drive them out. Prevent them from eating of the tree of the tree of life. That tree of life is what we have eaten of today. If you have given your heart to Jesus Christ, you have eternal life. You receiving the, the Jesus Christ, you have eaten of the bread of life. Jesus Christ said, anyone that eats of me will no longer die. The disciples could not understand. People could not understand. Because he is the tree of life. If you are here today, you are not born again. You have not eaten of the tree of life. You will die the second death. You will die the second death and go to hell. Death simply means separation from your creator. So it was mercy. It was the mercy of God that was released. Without you understanding the mercy of God, you can be very sure you will not be able to understand the nature and the character of God. The mercy of God. Now listen, the prodigal son, in Luke chapter 15, Luke chapter 15, verse 17 to 24, the prodigal son came to his father and he told his father voluntarily, look at the typo of it from the Garden of Eden. Father, I want to go. Give me my own inheritance and let me go. Luke chapter 15, verse, 20, verse 17 to 24. But after he left, the Bible says he came to himself and he said, many servants in my father's house have something to eat. But he now said, he said, look at, I'm going to read from verse 20. And he arose and came to his father. He arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion. Compassion. He felt mercy around to him. Now listen to me carefully. Anytime you arise and go towards the father, the father does not leave you out there hanging. He runs towards you. He doesn't wait for you to come. Immediately you set your motion to go, he does not stay there waiting for you. He runs to you. 
He runs to you. Listen, no matter what you might have been going through, listen, there is mercy. There is mercy. There is mercy. Our God is a God that is rich in mercy. He had compassion on him. Ran and embraced and kissed him. And the son said, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servant, bring quickly the best robe. Put it on him. Put on a ring in his hand, a shoe in his feet. And bring the fattest calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate. For my son that was dead is alive again. He was lost and is found. And he began to celebrate. Listen, God is not so, he's not interested. He is not a police, he's not a cop that is interested in hitting your head anytime you fall short of the mark. This is God, Jesus Christ. This is God. Anytime you run to him, he runs to you. Don't run away from the Father. Don't run away from him. Listen, when we were younger and we do some mischievous things, we'll go play football. As you mean, we go play football and we break the glass, the louvers of somebody, our neighbor's house. Where do you run to? Where do you run to? You run back to your father's house. Even though you know you have committed a crime, you don't run and go into exile because there is no peace in place of exile. Where do you run to? You run to your father. Even though I know my father will beat me, you know your father will flog you and beat you. But where do you run to? You run back home. Listen, mercy is at home. You have run out enough. It's time to come back home. Come on. It is time to come back home. The Father's hand is open, open to you. He's open to you to embrace you. You might have done whatever thing it may be. Some will say, well, I cannot forgive myself. I cannot forgive myself. I cannot believe that I did that. I committed abortion. Oh, I committed adultery. Oh, I committed fornication. Oh, I missed the mark. Oh, I did this. I did that. I care less about that. I don't want you to stay in it. Come back home. Run back to the Father. He's there waiting to embrace you. He's there waiting to welcome you back home. When you commit the crime, don't run away. Run back home. The Lord is waiting for you. Somebody say amen. Come on, somebody say amen. Somebody say amen. If you cannot forgive yourself, then you have yourself to blame. Now listen to me. When you fast forward and move forward a little bit, God was speaking through Moses. And he, well, he, he said, look, Moses, I want you to have something to represent me, which we call the Ark of Covenant. Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of Covenant is an Ark that was built to specification. It's like a box. Oh, I have the picture, but we can't really see it. It's like a box. And inside that box were three things. The rod of the rod of Aaron that bore dead. The golden pot that had the manna which the children of Israel ate. And then the stones, the Ten Commandments. They were what were in the box. Now, the rod, it represents God, the priest, correcting God's people. When you move out of your way, it says, the rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Psalm 23, verse 4. The rod and the staff, they comfort him. Then, what exactly the manna? The manna is God's provision. The manna is God's provision. The manna is God's word. It is there. And God's provision for man, supernatural provision. Thank you. And then the third one that you see in that box is what? Is what? Are you following me? Is what? The stones. I want you to. I want to be very sure you are following me. The Ten Commandments that Moses got from the from the from the from the mountain. They are in the in the. God says that Ten Commandments you must obey it. If you move away and you go into exile and you renounce me, I will use my rod to correct you. The manna is yet I will provide for you. But you know one thing. You see that thing. On that, on that cupboard, on that ark, is what we call the golden plate. That golden plate that covers the ark is the mercy seat. That is the mercy seat. And you see two cherubims putting like this. 
two cherubims covering like this, leaving an opening for the mercy of God, which is when you miss it, yes, I may use my rod to correct you. When you miss it, I may have to instruct you through the Ten Commandments, but the provision of mine will still be there. But above all, my mercy will not leave you. Ah, my mercy covered the judgment. My mercy covered the stone. My mercy covered the judgment. My mercy covered the stone. My mercy covers everything. I will not leave you. I will not leave you. The mercy seat was the golden plate placed on the Ark of Covenant with the two cherubims with their ends covered and create a space for the mercy of God to flow to his people, to flow to his people. Now listen, James chapter 2 verse 13, James chapter 2 verse 13, he says, for judgment without mercy to one who has shown no mercy, for judgment without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. But look at what the scripture says in the leading part. Come on church, read it with me. Mercy does what? Oh, speak it again. Come on, say it one more time. The mercy plate is upon the ark. It triumphs over the judgment of Moses. It triumphs over everything, the rod. Mercy triumphs over judgment. The mercy of God will speak for you. Ah, the mercy of God will speak for you. The mercy of God will speak for you. You will receive mercy in the name of Jesus. Now listen, this ark, very important, symbolizes the presence of the Lord. When the children of Israel were going to bring the ark from the Philistines' crime, from the, from the, from the, from the, from the uh, shrine of Aksano, that the, the, the gods of the Philistines, and God had told them, this is the way you carry the ark. Show you the ark again. You will see a pole that crossed through the ark. They were to be carried by the Levites. The Levites were to carry the ark. But on this very day, the Philistines didn't know how God has instructed the children of Israel. So they put the ark on, on a chariot, on a horse, on a mule, and allowed it to go to Israel because it was causing, causing them trouble. trouble. And the ark, as they were going, the children of Israel did not refer back to understand what God has said, the way they should, the manner they should carry the ark. The ark shook, and the ark was going to fall. What happened? There was a man who, who reached out to touch the ark, said the ark should not fall. Listen, the Bible said God smoked him because of his arrow. Now, these arrows can kill people. He did it innocently, but arrow killed him. Immediately this man touched the ark, he died. David said, no, 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 no. This ark must not come to the city of David. Who will take it? A young man called Obedidom. He said, bring the ark. He, he, Obedidom was, a known person, was, a, was an unknown person. He was an unknown entity. They, nobody recognized him. Obedidom told them to bring the ark into his house. In three months, 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 11 to 12. 2 Samuel 6, 11 to 12. In three months, when the ark of God came into the house of Obedidom, the house of Obedidom prospered. His children that could not go to nursery school, private school, began to go to private school. His, his, his chairs that were already broken and rickety, the opposite chair were torn. It began, in three months, he changed it. He, that he could not afford to eat three square meal because of the presence of God came, everything changed. And his neighbors observed that, listen, there is something happening to this man. In three months, the mercy of God came into his house. And everything changed. Now listen to me carefully. The house fellowship. When you bring the house fellowship to your house, you are bringing the ark of the covenant into your house. I tell you. I tell you. When the house fellowship comes into your house, you are bringing the ark. And because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, what happened to the house of Redidon will happen in your own house. Because you have brought his presence into his house. Into your house. You have brought his presence. Listen to me carefully. Maybe, to, maybe today, okay, at the end of today's message, we'll be calling for people to give up their house for the ark of covenant to come into their house. Please, don't think twice. We are making the call today. Let the ark of God come to your house. I'm telling you a true testimony. 
there was a sister in this church, a sister in this church, who we moved the house fellowship to the house. And she told me herself, she said, Pastor Larry, you know what? Since the day we brought the house fellowship to my house, my husband did not get a job. I could not get a good job. Immediately the act came, the house fellowship was brought into our house. My husband got a good job. I got a job. Things changed. And I began to look what exactly changed. He said, because the house fellowship came into a house. That is the truth. That is the truth. You want to clap? Come and clap for Jesus. That is the truth. The ark of covenant cannot come into a place and it will remain the same. The house I grew up in, I say this with all modesty, as a teenager, when I gave my heart to Christ, we used to have a fellowship in my own house. The house I grew up. And every Friday, between the hour of 12 and 4, we wake up and pray. Every Friday. The Ark of Covenant was brought to my home. And I tell you sincerely, friends, there is nobody that passed through our home, that I will pass through that house fellowship, that we, when we look back today, after many years, everybody is sorted out by God. I'm telling you, I stand on the altar of God, I tell you, every single person, I mean, we look at us because we know our numbers. We are all youth then. Everybody is sorted out by God. Don't play with the Ark of Covenant. Don't play with it. Please, look in deeper. The reason why you are struggling is because you have not allowed his presence. Say, I, don't, I want my privacy. What privacy are you talking about? Oh, I don't, I don't want people to know in my house. You know, I don't know this African. Look, 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 look. You are discounting yourself. Obey the dumb's life change. They told David, David had enough. Let's go and bring the Ark of Covenant to the city of David. And David looked into the book. He said, okay, this is the way God said we should do it. Levite, please put it on your shoulder. Let's bring it in. Somebody say amen. Somebody say amen. Now, the mercy of God is upon the, is upon the Ark. That's the covering of the Ark. And you will see, that was exactly what happened. In John chapter 8, verse 4 to 11. John 8, 4 to 11. They came to Jesus Christ and said, this woman is caught in the act of adultery. The Lord of Moses, you remember? The Ark of Covenant. What is in the Ark of the Covenant? What is inside the Ark? The Lord of Moses that we keep in our Ark says what? Church says what? Oh, come on. Technically, you put it on the, the Ark. The Lord of Moses says we should stone her. What do you say? They said to Jesus. They were trying to trap him. In saying something that could go, that they could use against him. They all know that the Lord of Moses is the template. The Lord of Moses said, we should stone her. She's caught in the act of adultery. We should stone her. But Jesus Christ did what? Verse 8. Then he stooped down and wrote in the dust. When the accuser had this, he stooped down. But what did he say? Verse 7. Let's, I, I, I jumped. Verse 7. He said, they kept demanding an answer. So he stooped down. He, he stood up. And said, all right, but let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. And then he stooped down again and he began to write. Look at verse 9. When the accuser had this, they slipped away one by one, bringing, beginning from the oldest until nobody was there. We accept that woman with Jesus. Accept mercy. They said, the Lord was said we should stone her. We should stone her. She should not leave. And Jesus Christ said, no. What you don't know is that above that, those laws that is in the, in the, in the, uh, in the, in the, uh, what's it in the ark, you are forgotten that what covers it is the mercy seat. It's the mercy seat. What covers it is the mercy seat. And anyone of you that have not crowned a stone, should, that have not committed a sin, should throw the first stone. And they all left away. Listen, you might have fallen, reach out for mercy. You might have aborted or done things that are wrong, atrocities before now, reach out for mercy. Mercy will speak for you. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 16. Say, let us therefore come boldly to the great throne of grace, that we may do what? Obtain, oh mercy. That we may obtain mercy. And find grace to help in times of need. Let's come to the throne of grace. 
to do one thing, not to obtain money. When you obtain mercy, money will come. Not to obtain degrees. When you obtain mercy, degrees will come. Not to have husband or wife. When you obtain mercy, he that findeth a wife, findeth a good thing, has an obtained favor, mercy from the Lord. It will come. When you obtain mercy, oh Jesus, you will obtain mercy. I pray for you today, you will obtain mercy. You will obtain mercy. Now listen, what are the two things that you need to have to obtain mercy? Psalm 51 verse 17. Psalm 51 verse 17. It said, the sacrifice of God is a broken spirit. A broken and a contrite heart. The sacrifice of God is a broken spirit. You will not despise, he will not despise a man. Another version says, the, the, the sacrifice pleasing to God is a broken spirit. God, you will not despise a broken and a humble heart. You've got to be broken. You cannot obtain mercy if you're not broken. If you're not broken. To be broken means to do away with your carnal nature. To do away with the carnal nature and yield to the will of God. To be broken is to admit and to acknowledge your limitation and inadequacies outside God. You need to be broken. I need to be broken. If you are not broken, you cannot obtain mercy. Luke chapter 18, Luke chapter 18, verse 10 to 14. Here we see two people who came before God. They came before the Lord. Two men went into the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The, the Pharisee is standing by himself praying thus, God, oh, I thank you. That I'm not like the other man. An extortioner. Unjust. Unjust. Adulterer. Or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I pay my tithe. And I do all that. I pay, I pay, I give tithe of all that I have. But what did the tax collector do? The tax collector standing afar off. He didn't even move close. He didn't move close. He didn't move close to God. He stood afar off. And what did he say? He said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. And anyone who humbles himself will be exalted. Anyone not broken cannot enjoy the mercies of God. You stand before God. I was talking with a sister a couple of years ago, maybe about 15, 20 years ago. She came to me. She was trusting God for a married partner. I said, Pastor Larry, I don't know why. I don't know why I'm not engaged. I don't know why men are not talking to me. Look at me. I'm still a virgin. I'm a virgin. I have never done immorality. Look at those people. Eh? Even the, the prostitutes, they are getting married. I mean, they are getting a partner. As I looked at her, I said, that is our problem. That is your problem. You can be proud of your holiness. You can be proud of your self-righteousness. If you are in that position, you cannot access mercy. It is not possible. It is not possible. Oh, it's only my church that we are only going to heaven. All of them there, look at them. They are not going to heaven. They won't make it. Oh, you are discounting, you are removing yourself from the mercy of God. That man, he said, it's not wrong to fast twice a week. It's not wrong to give your tithe. But if you think that is what will access you to have mercy. And let me quickly say, it is not wrong to live a holy life. I'm not saying it is wrong for you to live. That's what God expects of you to live a life that is full of chastity, purity. But if what you are saying, that if that is what you see, as we qualify you for mercy, you are wrong. You are far from mercy. That task collector came and said, Lord, have mercy on me. I know I have defrauded people. I have not come here to, uh, to, uh, to vindicate myself. All I've just come to ask for is your mercy. How many of us in the church today, we are like these Pharisees. We have our high cards. We have our high bones. We have our shoulder raised. We are the, we are the people the redeemed Christian church of God, the Rema Chapel. It is good to be proud of our church, but when we come before God, we must show that we have come on the platform of his what? Of his mercy. Rise to your feet.